Alrighty, hello, hello to everyone tuning in today to another Collision Repair Magazine Open Dialogue webinar. I'm Allison Rogers, the editor of Collision Repair, and we're here today with a stacked panel, lots of experts in the industry of uh, in the realms of skills training, uh, the skills shortage, and uh, acquiring foreign workers. Uh, we've got some experts on immigration here. We have Nemo from Tropicana, who's an expert in training, uh, training people for different trades uh, through the Tropicana through the Tropicana stream. And we've got Dominic from Skills Ontario here as well. We have Nina from CSM, but she's just having some technical difficulties. She will be here to join us in a few minutes, but uh, just bear with us here. Give us a couple more minutes for some people to join. We're right on the hour here. Before we launch into things too, I will run one of these polls. Um, and I just wanna apologize for the sound quality today. We do have a microphone uh, here looking all fancy, but unfortunately our uh, connection has been severed today. So I just wanna apologize for any echoing um, this is not our usual uh, production quality, uh, so we apologize for that. But you know, we we march on, and technology is a uh, is a beast. So I'll launch a poll right now and ask uh, where you're tuning in from. Let us know what sector of Canada you're tuning in from, what province, what area. All right, we've got Manitoba, Ontario, Atlantic Canada, Alberta in the house, BC, Quebec and Saskatchewan. Come on, represent. But uh, we've got lots of representation from all over Canada, which is great to see. Uh, still missing those people from Saskatchewan and Quebec. So if you know your friends out in Saskatchewan, let them know that we're live and they can come watch, but um, looks great. So uh, another poll we're gonna run just before we get started here. Uh, we'll see what your role in the industry is, see what kind of mix we're talking to today so we can you know, kind of cater our questions towards that. All right, some managers, some managers, some owners, other, the media here as well probably members of our own team. <laughs> All right, but cool. Looks like we've got mostly shop owners and managers on the call here today and some others, which I'm assuming are probably suppliers or distributors. Um, but uh, we've got about 40 people on the line here now. We're a couple minutes after two. So why don't we get started here? Um, before we introduce everyone, I'm just gonna give Nina a couple more minutes to join just because I, like I said, she's suffering some technical difficulties right now. Uh, but Nemo, let's introduce uh, Nemo here from Tropicana. Uh, we'd like to know a little bit about what Tropicana does and your role uh, in the skills industry, really. So if you could explain uh, Tropicana's assistance to the program and how you guys really fit into what we're talking about today, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you, Alison. Okay. Uh, my name is Nemo Abdelkadir, and I'm the Director of Employment Programs at Tropicana Community Services. Uh, Tropicana Community Services, in fact, has been serving the community for over 40 years. We are a multi-service community that provides services to youth, newcomers, people of Black, Caribbean, and African heritage in need with opportunities and alternatives that aid them in leading a successful lives. We offer over 30 programs and services, and some of our programs offered at Tropicana are youth development. This program assists clients to build skills, self-confidence, and be successful in school. Uh, in addition to that, we have another program called uh, Counseling Program, and this program is provided within a supportive environment where clients can develop the necessary skills to build and reinforce positive self-esteem, self-confidence, and independence. Uh, we also have two daycare centers, which, is, which are known as uh, Children of Tomorrow. And uh, Children of Tomorrow provide children between the ages of three to 12 years with a safe and enriching environment, while encouraging growth and development in all areas, including physical, emotional, social, and intellectual um, development. One of the big uh, main program offered is employment support and training. Tropicana Employment Center helps you prepare youth and adults to meet the challenges of an ever-changing job market through career exploration, pre-employment training, job search, and on-the-job training. We are one of the employment service providers in our GTA, and we all our programs and services are free. We have been providing employment services to the community for over 30 years. And we have a huge database of employers, and over the years, we have built a strong strategic partnership Annually, we provide employment uh, opportunities to around 5,000 uh, individuals. And um, since, since 2010, we've been running the Tropicana um, pre-apprenticeship training for those who are interested in a career in the auto body industry. Uh, this program has, was launched in 2010, and over the years, we have supported around 240 men and women into the trades. And we've had great support from our sponsors, like the coalition industry have been very supportive of, uh, of our program. 
Um, one of the things I would like to mention is according to the labor projection, youth recruitment and retention will be necessary focus for the automotive industry in the coming years. Um, key points that I would like to mention here is Canada's population, as we all know, is aging, and Ontario accounts for approximately 86% of the automotive um, employment. Focus for the automotive manufacturing in Ontario indicates that for the period of 2010 to 2023, the sector projected recruitment gap is around 30,000 employees. This is a very lucrative industry that is growing. And I'll encourage clients and youth who are interested in the program uh, to connect to Tropicana Community Services. Currently, we are waiting to hear from our funder uh, in terms of uh, the application that we recently submitted. And for those who are interested in the program, in the Orobotic uh, Coalition and Damage Repair Program, Program requirement is it's a 30 week full time program that runs between April and September. Individuals have to have grade 12 education and they have to be between the ages of 18 to 30 years legally entitled to, uh, to work in Canada. So if you're interested in the program, please uh, visit our website at Tropicana community.org, www.tropicanacommunity.org. And as I, as I mentioned, we are currently um, accepting uh, clients on our wait list. So for those who of you who are on this call, visit our website and try to learn more about our program. Thank you so much, Alison. Yeah, absolutely. We work a lot with Tropicana and I've seen firsthand their pre-apprenticeship class and how passionate they are. And like Nemo said, a lot of the industry, we know how tight knit this industry is, has stepped up to um, help with their programming. So I know 3M has helped with them, Sada's hosted some training sessions for them as well. And Centennial College offers their, their training services. And like Nemo said, it's all government funded and free. So uh, if you're interested, please check it out. But we're here to talk about um, here to talk about the skills shortage, obviously. So uh, we know it's not really a secret that the collision repair industry has been in a skills shortage for a long time. So uh, I'm going to launch a poll here. We were going to talk about some of the things that led us here uh, in this section of the webinar, but I think we all kind of know uh, the, the factors that led us here, other people in the industry that watched. I mean, the industry has known that this is going to be a pressing issue for a long time and they've kind of been screaming it to the masses and now people are starting to pay attention so it's great that people are starting to pay attention now but it's a little bit too late it seems so i'm, I'm asking people here in the audience have you been successful in hiring a skilled staff member in the last six months so people are still answering here but it looks to be pretty even split between 60 40 so 60 percent said yes they've hired someone in the past six months and were su successful with their hiring journey and about 40% is saying that they were not successful. So interesting statistics there. Yeah, it's still fluctuating a little bit, but um, from my experience traveling recently, and I know everyone else who travels in the industry, all of the suppliers and distributors watching uh, definitely are aware of um, the status of the, the industry all across Canada. So before we get more into things, I'm going to introduce our two other speakers here. So they're experts in immigration and we've got representation from Skills Canada. So Monet, how about you go first? Uh, tell us about your time in the industry and how you um, help the automotive sector with uh, the issues we're talking about today. Um, thank you, Alison. Uh, uh, my name is Monet Sony, and I'm into the immigration consulting uh, since 1997. Um, yeah, this April, I'll be completing 26 years in this field and uh, um, as we already know, the Canada, the whole Canada's uh, workforce system is built on immigration going 200 years back, 100 years back. Uh, we're all immigrants. Uh, but lately, what has happened is because of the aging workforce and a lot of um, uh, retirement and a lot of people, uh, a lot of people in the business communities, uh, they're not able to pass on their business uh, legacy to the next generation because they, they don't want to do it. Uh, so we have been helping businesses uh, for long and majority of our client portfolio is business owners like these participants from all uh, industries. And uh, yes, this is, uh, you know, people are not able to get dishwashers so, like banquet halls are getting dishwashers from outside Canada. It's, it's that hard to find people. Uh, uh, during my presentation, I will address the, how the process works. Uh, how the collision industry can benefit, how we have helped um, and the collision auto collision centers in the past uh, with specifics to the jobs, the job positions related to the industry. And then we'll talk more about it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Monet. We're glad to have you here today. And I know you've got lots of expertise working with automotive businesses in the sector. So any questions that you guys have, feel free to save them for the Q&A in the chat, uh, or you can 
Uh, we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end, so we'll make sure we get to any questions. And I'm Dominic from Skills Ontario. Uh, tell us about your role and how you uh, contribute to the skills shortage, uh, solving it really. Yes, thanks, Allison. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Dominic Machado. I'm from Skill Trades Ontario. We're a new organization to Ontario. Uh, we opened our doors January 1st, 2022. Uh, we were born out, out of the old Ontario College of Trades. For those in Ontario on the call that might be familiar with that organization, we don't do exactly everything that they used to do, but we still provide a lot of the same services to the skilled trades people. So just a little bit about us. We're here now to support Ontario's economic success as a central authority responsible for establishing leading edge standards uh, in the skilled trades to meet the opportunities of today. And obviously the challenges of not only today, but of tomorrow with this uh, labor shortage. Uh, our goal is to work with government and our partners in industry to address this labor shortage, uh, to make the skilled trades uh, hopefully easier and faster to get into, to improve the services that we provide, and really try and promote the skilled trades, especially to our young generation, which is the up and coming next generation of skilled trade workers. So some of the things that you know we do here, first of all, our organization, we're a service delivery agent for the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skill Development in Ontario. So it's a very long acronym, um, but basically we provide those services to skilled trades people that the ministry looks to have across Ontario. Part of those services are that we uh, are the authority for Ontario's representation in the Red Seal program. So I know we have people on the call from all across the country. I'm sure you're familiar with Red Seal certification in your province. It is a national program. We are the leading authority for Ontario in that program. So people who are licensed in their trade that have a Red Seal, it'll be recognized all across Canada. They can move within Canada to other jurisdictions. They don't require additional examination. Bring your Red Seal license and be ready to work. Uh, part of what we also do is for apprenticeships. So for the apprentices out there, we develop the training standards and the curriculum by which our apprentices are trained in school. And then finally, with conjunction uh, industry involvement, we also develop those certifying exams that those completed apprentices would also write to become certified in their skilled trades. Here we refer to it as a certificate of qualification, for short CFQ, because once again, it's another long name, uh, and in the industry, most commonly known as a license. So uh, we also uh, provided a secondary service, which is what is the big interest of this webinar here today, where we assess the qualifications and experience of foreign trained workers who've had years of experience in the trade they're now looking to come to Ontario. They're looking to get into the skilled trades. They're looking to get qualified. The folks out there, especially in the body industry, are looking to have the, these people work for them. So we help those individuals through that process to get their 310B certifications here so they can go to work immediately in the trades. Uh, and lastly, is a, a few other items that we also provide. Obviously, when you pass the exam, we issue your certificate of qualification, which is your license to work. For those trades that require that certification to be renewed, like the 310B trade, which is annual, and the other 22 compulsory trades in that sector, uh, we also administer that process where we go through the renewal with the, those tradespeople. And part of that is on our website, we actually have a public register where anybody in Ontario, be it tradespeople, employers, the public, literally anybody in the world can access our website to see who in Ontario is trained to do what trade in those 23 compulsory trades that we have, if they're a registered apprentice, if they're a license holder, which we call the certificate of qualification holder or a journey person, for those who are familiar with that term in the trade. So we provide as a service. So that way, when you're engaging trades people, you're confident to know that the people you're dealing with are actually licensed and trained. And then lastly, and which is always an ongoing effort, we're always conducting research into the apprenticeship program to see how can we better train our apprentices to align them with the needs of industry and obviously industry growing at such a tremendous rate these days in terms of technology to really keep our folks up to date, you know, and valuable for those uh, skilled trades out there. So that's about us in a nutshell. In a nutshell, yeah, I'm sure people have a lot of questions, uh, especially from Ontario, because we know we were kind of shaken up without uh, the 
the, the organization for a while. And then with you guys now coming in, there's a lot of uh, questions I'm sure to know about uh, what, what you offer. So thanks for answering that all there, Dominic. Um, we'll hear more from Dominic later, but we're gonna go back to you, Monet, right now. Uh, Monet's gonna show a presentation about the foreign worker process and immigration. So let me just set up the screen share here before Monet gets into the presentation. And like I said, we're gonna have a Q&A session at the end. So feel free to send your questions in as they come and uh, we will get to them at the end. So Mona, just let me know when you want me to skip a slide uh, and the stage is yours. Um, thank you, Alison. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to the organizers and all the stakeholders to allow me to be with these magnific magnificent uh, um, decision makers. So yeah, so temporary foreign worker program, as we all know, uh, people in um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, and Western Canada, for that matter, are a little more. Uh, I think they they know the program a little more uh, than the Ontarian um, businesses. This is what is my experience. So if you can go to the next slide. So as I said, uh, I have about twenty five five plus years in immigration consulting. Uh, very seasoned in foreign worker processing. We have served uh, businesses ranging from under 1 million revenue to $170 million revenue, basically small to medium enterprise. Uh, proven exposure with this particular industry, we have helped a lot of uh, auto collision repair centers in Ontario to get their workers from Europe, from the Middle East, uh, some of them from South Asia. So we have had that experience. We understand that pain. Uh, can we have the next slide? So I'll just jump on to the issue. I think this doesn't need to be even mentioned, but I thought I would just bring it by you. Um, the shortage is not a news anymore, uh, as Alison mentioned in the beginning. Um, uh, for some reason, there are no Canadian takers for these jobs in apprenticeship. The, the interest from the youth, especially people graduating out of high schools, uh, is declining. Uh, to take on these jobs or to enter this particular sector. Uh, and there is a very less awareness and exposure on foreign manpower. A lot of companies still uh, think or they're still shy of knowing more and trying to uh, utilize the foreign worker program uh, for, to fulfill their skill shortages. There is, I, I feel there is still a, a large gap to fill in terms of knowledge and in terms of uh, the the utility that this program offers to any industry and especially to the automotive industry. Uh, some of the businesses are even ready to pay us a hiring bonus if we find them people uh, from anywhere in the world or even within, uh, you know, uh, within the country. And aging workforce is again, it's, 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 it's a news which is known to everybody in the country. Uh, especially post COVID what I see is uh, amongst the youth and amongst the people even who are already into the industry. Uh, there is a greater shift to the careers in the digital world. Uh, people want to be, uh, you know, digital savvy. Somebody wants to be a YouTuber. Somebody wants to be a blogger. People uh, normally want to work from home or not work from the work. Uh, that is a trend that is also, uh, you know, is um, shifting the whole, uh, you know, uh, focus on being going to the work and especially to these uh, creative uh, you know job position to the totally digital side of the to the workforce uh, another thing is uh, many areas many um, you know communities many business communities um, there is a need to shift their paradigm uh, about the foreign worker concept itself uh, because many times companies have tried uh, to bring in the workers, but there has been an undefined or unwritten resistance from the existing workforce. I'm sure the HR guys are uh, in this group and then um, they might have come across this, this, this problem uh, in their experience if they, if they tried to utilize the foreign worker program. Uh, Alison, can I have the next slide? I've tried to I've tried to keep the slides very very uh, you know very very precise because of the time constraint and then I'll be happy to you know we'll have a question Q&A session definitely and I will be happy to answer the questions. So uh, TFWP Temporary Foreign Worker Program uh, I want I just want to highlight here that this program is not 
uh, of the immigrants coming into the country uh, as permanent residents. So they are basically the newcomers, the people who already are the permanent residents of Canada. But these are the people who are working outside Canada in your industry. They have the required skill set. They have the required exposure. They have the required, um, uh, you know, experience uh, to to be working in your shops or you know bigger collision or auto collision repair centers. But these are the guys who will be basically sponsored by you as the foreign workers. So. First of all, it's a demonstration of recruitment efforts. It takes about four to six weeks. I'm just you know, bringing a typical timeline. What are you looking at? Uh, then you have to prepare a recruitment summary where you have to interview the Canadians, if any. You will be surprised. We, in your own industry, uh, we have advertised for auto body repairs, auto painters, welders, uh, even the groomers, uh, not a single Canadian resume. And that is within the heart of the GTA. Uh, yeah, it's surprising. So the process uh, itself, the uh, the approval of your job offering is formally called as labor market impact impact assessment. That takes about four to six weeks. Um, and uh, any the person who is signing the application or the decision maker in this regard is uh, interviewed by a Service Canada professional. Um, if it's a positive assessment, one you get that decision in one to two days. And then the work permit application. Uh, this is basically the candidate that you have selected and you have approved, uh, a candidate that has been approved by Service Canada to be hired by you as a foreign worker. Then they make their work permit application from the respective country. I've put a question mark on that because it varies from country to country. Uh, if anybody wants, if or any, anybody has a worker in mind, uh, they can send me an email at the end of the presentation. I can tell them what is the processing time. It ranges from anywhere from four to six weeks to up to 15 to 20 weeks. The processing timelines have improved significantly. Uh, during COVID, it was 54 weeks and it was really painful for the, for the employers to wait for their foreign workers for almost a year because of the obvious reason that the embassies were not open, there were COVID-related restrictions and so forth. Alison, can I have the next slide, please? Yes, um, this program does come with their own challenges. If any of you have already utilized foreign workers, I'm sure you have. You might have come one of these challenges. One is, of course, the application processing times. It is really frustrating for a business to have selected a candidate and you know wait four to five months uh, for them to join. Uh, this is this has been uh, you know constantly uh, uh, you know existing pain point for the for any industry probably you guys can lobby with the with the government of Canada but yes this is this is a, the one of the biggest challenge unforeseen circumstances sometimes you have spent few weeks few months trying to hire in the foreign worker and probably they'll send an email now they have some family commitment they cannot join you or probably you have filled that position uh, locally or you know anything can happen because the because of the time span it takes, to from the day one till the guy joins, shows up at work in their safety shoes at your shop, um, there could be anything. Then adapting to the Canadian work culture, a lot of time there is there are these issues. Some people come from some communities which uh, operate in a different way. Um, you know, the employer-employee relationship and the rapport that work on different belief systems. So sometimes it takes a while for the foreign worker to to you know assimilate into our work culture depending upon where are they coming from team integration issues uh, like i said in my previous slides uh, sometimes you really feel that there is a bit of resistance uh, because for many companies it could be a new thing having a foreign guy coming and working with in their local team so sometimes uh, you know it, it takes a little bit time to to adjust to with each other when it comes to two people working in the same job position or two people working at the same, you know, at the same shop or a same object or a same vehicle. Uh, there are costs associated with this. Um, per position, you have the, the, the government fees is $1,000 per position. Let's say if you're hiring five auto painters or auto body repairers, depending upon the location of the job and how many people you're looking at. 
So after every five positions, you're you're spending five thousand dollars on the government fees. And there's a cost associated with the uh, advertising campaign because this is not a typical, um, you know, this is not a typical indeed job that we put for attracting locals. There are certain advertising guidelines parameters that we have to follow. Uh, if we do not follow, then application uh, our application for hiring a foreign worker will be considered as non-compliant. So there is a set pattern where in the, there's a minimum number of mediums uh, that you have to advertise the job in a certain fashion uh, across the nation. So there is definitely a cost associated with that advertising campaign. And then you have to have one person to filter those resumes and stuff. It's a little bit easier these days, as I said, so many applications I find not even a single Canadian applying for it. And that is like within a very, you know, densely clustered community like GTA. Um, then worker retention, uh, there is definitely, it's rare, but it's there. Um, Inter-company poaching, a lot of your competitors may, you may have a very good painter and the word travels fast within the community and other people are trying to retain your worker. Um, latest is now provinces poaching each, other, each other's uh, skilled workers. Like Alberta is very aggressively advertising on all the skilled professionals to, or skilled workers to, to you know, uh, to relocate to Alberta. Their tagline is a shorter commute to a bigger house. Um, so yes, this is the challenge that, <laughs> This is the challenge that uh, you know many many employers are facing. Can I have the next slide? Thank you, Alison. Uh, so the benefits outweigh the challenges. Definitely, you have a dedicated workforce because these foreign workers, when they come and work for you, uh, this is a restricted work permit, which means it is uh, employer specific, it is job specific, it is location specific. It is um, wage specific. So you have a dedicated person working on that position on those uh, you know, job duties for at least two years to three years. Definitely fulfilling the skill gap. Um, it's a no brainer. Transfer of skills and knowledge to Canadians. What I've again gained from my experience is uh, there are, uh, I came across a couple of collision, auto collision repair centers where they had very specialized uh, body painting systems. They said these systems are, you know, they, they are manufactured by European companies. And then there is a certain way to operate these systems. They don't have many people who know to operate these kind of systems uh, without taking any names. So this is what has been my experience. So definitely if you, you get a person who's experienced on a certain kind of a machinery or a tool or an equipment, uh, will definitely be transferring their skills and knowledge to Canadians if there are any people willing to train. Socioeconomic benefits. Uh, this is something, um, you know, this, this you can interrelate this part to the worker retention. For example, some, some companies, when they bring their foreign workers, they offer it as an incentive. You work with us six to eight months, we'll bear the cost to bring your family here. And the good news is, um, before only the skilled workers or the higher skilled positions could bring their families on temporary visas. Now, uh, any type of even a cleaner, a janitor in the auto shop can bring their family and kids to Canada. So this is a very big incentive. So this also you know, contributes to the local social fabric, but then this also helps a company retain the foreign worker with them because there is a certain kind of, a, um, although, although not very long lived, but there is certain kind of a loyalty and a rapport with the employer. If you help those workers, uh, you know, um, getting assimilated into the local society, the local, you know, fabric. Definitely, uh, you guys need to have a proactive approach. And thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. <laughs> yes, Alison, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, the last slide is Q&A, definitely. Um, you can be in touch. This is my email address, phone number. And you can also send your questions to the organizers. They can forward it to me and I can, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Monet. A lot of information there. So uh, we'll put uh, his email in the chat here in a second. So if you missed uh, writing it down whenever the slide was up on the screen, then you can answer, get any questions over to Monet. Or if you want to ask in the Q&A, uh, feel free to ask there. We might be able to answer your question live on the air. 
Uh, but thank you so much for that very extensive background. Um, there's a lot of information that people need to know, obviously, but like you said there, the benefits outweigh the challenges. I think it's really interesting that, you know, it's employer specific, it's pay specific. Uh, so that person, I don't want to say they're stuck with you, but you do have a team member for an extended period. So that is really great to, um, really great information for the shops to know. And it's one of the ways we can uh, help target the skills shortage. So I know I've spoken to shops that have hired um, some foreign workers as well, specifically in Saskatchewan too, um, in some rural communities out there. So you can really do it anywhere. People in rural Saskatchewan can get someone to commute out there, uh, commute to, to move out there uh, from a foreign country. I'm pretty sure we could do it here anywhere in Canada. So um, I'm not only to Saskatchewan, I don't wanna say that, but. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we'll go over to um, Dominic's presentation now. Uh, Dominic's going to talk about trade equivalency uh, assessments and Skills Ontario's role in the uh, in the industry. So let me just pull my share screen of Dominic's presentation up. Give me one second here. Oops. Sorry guys, bear with me here a second. I have too many PowerPoint slides open. Okay. Do some Jeopardy music or something for when Allison's moving her buttons around. Okay, there we go. There we go. There you go, Dominic, your stage is yours. All right, thanks so much, Allison. And uh, thank you to Collision Repair Magazine and Tropicana for inviting Skilled Trades Ontario and myself here to speak to you guys today. Um, some of the information that Monique provided you're probably going to hear me repeat as well in terms of the labor shortage. Um, and it's not because we coordinated ahead of time. It's just because it's true. So here we are. Um, so as I said in the initial intro, my name is Dominic Machado. I'm the supervisor of registration assessments with Skills on Tra Skill Trades Ontario. I'm just going to call it STO for short. Once again, another long name. So at STO, me and my team specifically deal with assessing the experience and qualifications of domestically trained workers in the skilled trades that may not have done a traditional apprenticeship but wish to get certified and more importantly international foreign trained workers who have this years of uh, skilled trades experience that they would like to come to Ontario to work but they need to be certified we absolutely help those folks as well and we also help those folks in the other provinces where some of you are from that they are licensed in those provinces they have their red seal they need to come to Ontario to work for whatever reason. They need their license here. We absolutely help those folks. There's no retesting for those red seal holders. They simply apply to us and we give them the certification. So in addition to that, which I didn't mention in my original info is that I'm actually from the Skill Trades myself. So not only do I work for Skill Trades Ontario, I am a client of Skill Trades Ontario. I come from what I believe all of you call in your provinces, the automotive service technician trade. So I'm not in the auto body trade, but once again, closely related. Uh, some of my good friends are actually from the auto body trade. So I like to think, you know, motive power, we all like to band together. Uh, I did give you a quick intro on skilled trade. So I will try to move it along in keeping in time. So Allison, if you can go to the next slide and certainly the next slide. And let's just go to the next one. Sure, why not? So uh, I talked a little bit earlier about who skilled trades is. So I, th I think just to give you a little idea about the trades here in Ontario, because I know for some of you are out of province. So just to kind of give you some of those uh, hard numbers to kind of drive home some of those things that were mentioned previously. So right now we're looking about one in five new jobs in Ontario are expected to be in a trades related occupation by 2025. So this doesn't necessarily mean on the tools on the bench working in the skilled trades, but for those individuals who put their time in in the skilled trades, sort of like myself, um, we then move on to other occupations, but are still related to skill trades, just like me right now. So perfect example of that. Right now, you know, obviously the pandemic took a toll on all kinds of industries. Skill trades were not immune to that. And right now there's a 70% job vacancy in the skill trades post pandemic. So that's a huge number, right? Just in the construction industry alone, they need about 35% more workers right now just to keep that construction boat afloat, right? So definitely some daunting numbers there. And then as you can see, skilled trade professionals are critical to Ontario and your province where you're from, economic growth and success. 
near, and as, as Monet alluded to, nearly one in three journey pe persons in Ontario, so license holders, are 55 years plus. Unfortunately, I'm not quite there yet, but I will get there soon. Uh, so retirement is one of those number one driving factors for this labor shortage. The reality is, hey, we're all getting old and I don't wanna work anymore when I'm old. So guess what? It's time to leave the tools, time to leave the bench, time to leave that trade related occupation. But at the same time, as we leave those vacancies, we need people to fill those vacancies. So uh, with that in mind, we, all, we always throw out construction numbers because they seem to be the biggest impacted industries. And as you can see on the slide, uh, it's predicted that in construction alone, more than 100,000 additional workers will be needed in the next de decade in Ontario. Uh, so hopefully with skilled trades, Ontario's involvement or Stowe's involvement will make that process easier and faster for people to get into the skilled trades, not just in construction, but also in motor power and also into the auto body trades. Uh, next slide. So in Ontario, we offer 144 apprenticeable, apprenticeable skilled trades. Of those 144, 23 are what we call compulsory. Compulsory meaning that to legally work in the trade, you must be a registered apprentice or a license holder. Uh, of those trades is the 310B auto body and collision damage repair. And for some of you on the call outside of the province, uh, we throw up a trade code for each of our trades just to help us to easier refer to them. So 310B is the one we're focused on here today. Um, and out of those 121 other trades, non-compulsory as we refer to them, apprenticeship is available. Uh, some of them certifications actually available. So some of them don't have a certifying exam, but through industry, some of those trades, industry uh, employers actually insist not only in their employees being trained through the apprenticeship program, or at least certified. So having that license, if it is available. So that's definitely key for those industries as well. So even though we're not holding industry to that standard, industry is holding themselves to a higher standard. So I can absolutely get behind that. Uh, next slide, Allison. Okay, so right now, in-demand trades. So just to give you a little bit of idea about the trades here in Ontario, we break them up into four categories, construction, motor power, industrial, and services. And across all those trades, we have individuals that um, can be Red Seal certified if the trade is such designated Red Seal, or it could be a provincial trade where the provincial license is the only accreditation available. And in some trades, the high, uh, completing the apprenticeship is the highest form of accreditation. As you can see here, the top five trades, as mentioned previously, welder is definitely in demand, industrial electrician, industrial mechanic millwright, painter and decorator, and cook. Now, some of those might surprise you, but uh, the reality is it's not so much that there's a shortage in those areas, so you don't see auto body and collision damage repair on there. It's just that there's a need in those areas above what is currently being filled already by skilled trades people in those areas. Some of these in-demand jobs are driven by legislation where you see Cook on there as recently in Ontario, we've had legislation passed that individuals in our long-term care homes that serve uh, food and meals to our aging population are now required to be certified. So hence the, the need for certified cooks out there. Uh, next slide, Allison. So labor market information, I think you got a, a lot of that already. So I will just touch on this very briefly to say that in the slide, there is actually a link where it's underlying Government Ontario website. And certainly you guys are welcome to the slide uh, if you want to reach out to Allison or even to myself. Um, I'll just quickly say that you know, if, if you're, whether it be yourself, probably not yourself, but somebody you know, a young child, a friend of a friend, uh, even some workers that might be thinking to come to Ontario to get into skilled trades, maybe not the auto body trade, and you want to learn more about what are those in-demand skilled trades, uh, what are the average income for those trades, what does a lifestyle in that trade look like, how long does training in that trade take, all that kind of information, you can find at that link. And, and the, the slide speaks to all that as well, too. So definitely you can prep yourself in advance um, for a, a successful career in a skilled trade. Uh, next slide. So I will touch briefly on apprenticeship uh, because it's not really the focus of the webinar here, but once I want you guys just to be a little bit informed so you have a little bit of a takeaway on this topic. So apprenticeship is considered post-secondary education, much like college or university. The difference is it's a different kind of post-secondary education. So as opposed to sitting in a classroom for eight months for 
uh, you know, a two-year program, three-year program, four-year program, you're actually on the job learning as well as attending school when the time comes. So while you're on the job learning, you're getting paid for that. And as the slide says, and depending on the trade, at least 80% of your learning is done on the job. And that additional 20% give or take is done in the classroom. Because, hey, as great as we are training people on the job, sometimes we do need that theory behind it that's supported by the classroom. And even at that, you know, apprentices still get some practical uh, assessments in the classroom as well, too. So that's if you're thinking about apprenticeship, it's definitely a pathway to go. It is considered post-secondary education as well. Uh, next slide. So the very Coles Notes version of how to become an apprentice. Uh, so for any of you that's ever sponsored an apprentice out there, uh, it could be a little bit of a daunting task, but to become an apprentice, it's pretty straightforward. The first biggest hurdle is find a sponsor. You need somebody to sponsor you. That's literally it, the whole foundation of apprenticeship. With that in mind, there are very few requirements that you need. Number one, minimum age of 16. Number two, you have to be able to legally work in Ontario, Canada, which usually comes in the form of having a social insurance number. Uh, number three, you have to meet the educational requirement for the trade. Now, this might seem tough as first, but the reality is for most of the trades, the requirement is grade 12 or equivalent. So if you have like an OSSD, Ontario Secondary School Diploma, and for those trades that are not grade 12, it's grade 10. Now, when we talk about foreign trained workers, if somebody does have experience in the trade, but maybe they're not at the licensing level yet, they can still gain that experience through an apprenticeship. And they can have their international or foreign education assessed by various organizations to see what their equivalency here is in Ontario. And should they meet that mark? Great, go ahead and register. If not, there are obviously several programs out there, GED, et cetera, that will help you to achieve that educational requirement to then become registered. So once you have all those requirements, you have a sponsor, the ministry who is responsible for registering all apprentices in Ontario, regardless of the trade, whether it's compulsory or not, you'll then sign a registered training agreement or we call it RTA for short, because we like giving everything very long names. And then at that point, you just go out, start working. When the time comes, they'll send you calls to school. You can attend your in-school sessions. And then when those sessions are done, you go back to work until your next session. Typically, apprenticeship has three in-class sessions. Once again, typically across the trades, some trades, it's less. And for a few trades out there, it's actually more. There's actually a fourth in-class session. So uh, next slide, Allison. So why, why get into an apprenticeship? Why get into skilled trades? Uh, as you see, a lot of information on the slide. I'm just going to kind of Coles notes it for you. So those people that do go through apprenticeship, the goal is not to complete the apprenticeship. The goal is to be certified. That comes by completing the apprenticeship. The value as a skilled tradesperson is when you become certified in that trade. So you have your license. Typically, research shows that individuals that complete a program and get licensed tend to get better jobs in terms of permanent employment. So not contract or temporary, but actually permanent jobs. If you are licensed, you tend to have higher annual wages in that job as well, too. And you're actually working in a career that you've actually been trained for. So how many people do we know that they went to college or they went to university for this particular program? And because they're attending school throughout that time, when they finish that program, they have their certificate or diploma. Now they're trying to find a job in that industry. Well, with apprenticeship, you're already in that industry working. So it's just a natural pathway for you to get your certification and you are already doing the job that you're trained to do. You're not struggling to find a job now. And I'll, I'll once again, a lot of those jobs, as well as the trade related jobs, like how I'm in now, they also have, provide employees with great benefits, right? So I won't touch on the information on the right-hand side of the slide. I'm sure you guys can all see it there. Um, but that sort of gives you the cold notes about, about apprenticeship. So here's where I really want to focus is the meat and potatoes of it is the experienced uh, skilled workers that we want to get into Ontario to fill that skilled trade shortage. So we call it here at Skilled Trades Ontario, we call it the trade equivalency assessment. For short, we will call it T. Once again, another long name given to another process. So with the, with the T process, we evaluate your experience and hours in the trade that you've gained internationally for you to then 
be approved, hopefully, to then challenge the exam for that skilled trade here in Ontario. You will be writing the same exam that a completed apprentice would write. So it's, it's a process that's fair and transparent for all, and we're holding those foreign trained workers to the same standard at which we hold our uh, completed apprentices here on Ontario. Uh, next slide, Allison. So the requirements for this for the process. So once again, we have we have a guide that's posted on our website, and you know anyone's happy to contact. You're free to contact me. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. But we do post a comprehensive guide on our website that tells you all the requirements that you need for the skilled trades process. We're looking for proof and verifiable proof of that experience and hours that you have in the trade in order to approve you through the assessment process. And the, the, the nice thing about this process is you do not have to be in Canada to do it. You do not have to have an immigration status with Canada to do it. You could le literally be sitting on a chair on a beach in Costa Rica, and if you got a laptop and an internet connection, you can apply for trade equivalency assessment. So this entire process can be done before you set foot on Canadian soil, and for us specifically in Ontario. I will say that with a caveat that if you are approved when it comes time to write the final exam for your certification, you do have to be here in person to attend one of our 30 plus ministry offices across the province to write that exam in person, right? So like I said, the entire T process can be done from the comfort of your living room, but when it's time for certification, you have to be here to write the license. So this does help individuals because for those thinking of coming to Canada, they can get this process all done before they even make that first thought of where am I going to go in Ontario, right? So get the whole process done. And a lot of times when individuals are applying for visas to come to Canada to write the exam, that approval letter we give them indicating that they're now ready to write the exam, that's part of their application that gets them here to write those exams. So those individuals could actually be licensed in Ontario, having never lived in Ontario, but now are valuable, experienced, trained, skilled, and certified foreign workers that you guys can now hire and put to work right away because they already have an Ontario certification. So I think that's the biggest benefit to this process. And as the note in the slide says, once again, you don't have to be here to do this. So uh, next slide, Allison. So having said that, it seems like a very pretty easy process, right? I apply, I get approved, I come here, I write the exam, I get certified. And it is fairly straightforward once you follow the instructions in the guide. So this is where the slide, I wanna to touch on the importance of reading the guide thoroughly. And certainly we are absolutely here to answer any questions anybody may have throughout their process. We actually have a dedicated email address in the guide just for individuals to send their questions so we can address them before they apply to make their applications the most successful. So like the slide says, number one, read through the guide thoroughly. Number two, provide as much information as you can. We're looking for verifiable proof of your past work experience in this trade. For the uh, 310B trade, auto body collision damage repair, the requirement is 8,000 hours, which is roughly uh, just over um, four and a half years worth of work, give or take. So if you have four and a half years of full-time employment in the skilled trades, you're absolutely a candidate for this process. Uh, part of that process is getting those reference letters from your references who can personally attest to your hours and skill sets in the trades. And they have to be aware that, yes, you know what, we may contact them to verify all this. So they have to be available and they have to be willing to participate in that process. If you are from a foreign country where maybe English is not the first language, we do ask that any documentation you do provide us be in English or French, and if not, please have it translated into English by a Canadian certified translator. So for those in Ontario, that would be the ATIO, which is uh, our provincial registration um, organization for translators. So we will only accept it from them from Ontario, but obviously from other provinces have their own um, translation registries, which we will we'll accept as well. Uh, some, so in this particular trade, there's no additional requirements like the slide says, but some trades there are additional requirements. And the whole process start to finish from the time you submit your application, provided that you provided everything that has been asked for in the, in the guide, 
And if everything's in order, you're looking at about an eight week turnaround. So the day you send us an email with your application package, eight weeks later, you should get a decision. Once again, we do have periods of higher volume. So as the last bullet says, we do appreciate your patience. I do have a small team of just over uh, 12 individuals that manage this entire process for the entire province. We receive at least 100 applications a week. And in turn, we process as many as humanly possible because we realize there's a human being on the other end of that that's waiting for our decision to move forward with their next life choice. Uh, next slide, Allison. Uh, lastly, I'll just touch on this one quickly. So when it does finally come down to the exam portion of your certification, uh, once again, you'll write your exam at one of our 30 plus ministry offices across the province. We do offer accommodations for those individuals that need it. So should you need more time to write the exam, perhaps a quiet space to write the exam, uh, should you have some type of learning disability that you need other accommodations for, the ministry offices are happy to work with you on that. Uh, if, language, if English is not your first language, you need an interpreter, we do ask you to find your own interpreter, but the ministry staff will go through with you in terms of vetting those interpreters to make them eligible to attend the exam with you. There's other, off, there's other um, organizations in the province that offer other services, whether it be federally funded or provincially funded, in terms of upgrading your language skills, uh, or even as, uh, as far as ESL, so that way you know, you're comfortable with how uh, Ontarians communicate in English, so you can be part of that process as well, because these are the folks you're going to be working with side by side, so you want to be able to communicate with them as best as possible when you're working in that skill trade. Uh, and uh, lastly, on the slide there, Employment Ontario, they're, help, they're there to help you guys navigate in terms of, you know, what are the requirements of the trade, how the trade is practiced, et cetera, et cetera, to really give you some more information about those processes. And then lastly, uh, for those that are, uh, sorry, next slide, Allison. And so lastly, on this slide, um, along with the ministry, when we opened our doors, we did open up an online portal. So while we do accept applications via email, we also accept the mail if you want to mail them to us, which I don't recommend. I love our postal service folks, but hey, stuff gets lost, stuff gets damaged. We don't want that. We don't want any delays in processing your application. So easiest thing is you can email it to us if that's the most convenient for you. But we also also have an online portal, which once again, you could be sitting in a chair on a beach in Costa Rica. And if you got a laptop and internet connection, you can open up a portal account sign in, submit your application online, upload all your documents, and in about eight weeks, we'll tell you yes or no if you're writing that exam. And that, folks, is it for me. Uh, last slide is just a thank you. I don't have my contact information on there, but Allison has all my contact information. So feel free to reach out to her. Feel free to ask for the slide deck. Happy to answer all questions and share what information I can. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dominic. Again, lots of information there. Uh, you might have to, some people watching might have to rewatch just to get all of the information down here, but it's great to see that Ontario has such a, such a good plan for uh, trade equivalency assessments. And, you know, the eight week turnaround, that's, you say be patient, but that's pretty fast in my mind. It's so nice to see that you guys uh, have a quick turnaround there and uh, realize there's another person on the other end who your decision is being affected by. Uh, so whether you're a collision owner or if you're someone looking to come to Canada to work in the industry or if you're a manager, if you're the person in charge of hiring decisions or if you're just a delegate of the collision repair industry that wants to help uh, out in the skills shortage, feel free to reach out to any of uh, to myself, uh, any of our speakers here. I have all of their contact information like Dominic said, if you'd like to talk to Nemo or Dominic, just reach out to me and I can give you their email. Uh, and we can talk about uh, different ways we can target the skills shortage and uh, how these different ways can uh, help you guys in the shops on the ground level. So, well, there's always initiatives going on uh, for our people in our own country and, you know, Canadian citizens to fill the trade gaps. Uh, we need to look elsewhere as well. So um, it's great that Canada is so welcoming to pe people uh, coming into the industry to work. And um, we're really lucky that way. So be sure you take advantage of the program here. We don't have any questions sitting in the chat right now but if anyone has any questions feel free to send them my way now after the chat oh, i can always send them around to our panelists um this session is recorded and we will have a recording available tomorrow so uh, be sure to check the e-zine tomorrow we promise this time it'll be in the e-zine tomorrow and uh, thank you for dealing with my microphone again today uh, guys really appreciate uh 
everyone's cooperation. Um, we've got some questions here now. All right, so uh, someone wants to know if Monet's taking new clients. <laughs> yes, definitely. We're always looking forward to work with the businesses. Uh, like I said, our uh, you know our whole foundation of this this firm is helping businesses, assisting them, and in turn uh, being rewarded for our work. Yes, definitely we are taking on new clients and uh, we may have some references for you uh, uh, in your industry. Thank you. Yeah, so Heather, be sure you get um, on its emails in the chat there. Uh, so we've got another question from an anonymous uh, attendee for any of the speakers. Uh, in your opinion, what have been the most effective strategies for attracting new talent in the industry? This person's a recruiter. So what do you think they're, the best strategies for a recruiter would be? just in skills, I guess, in general, um, to promote the skilled trades. I mean, a lot of the things we talk about just at the magazine would be, um, when you look up the wages for an auto body, uh, about an auto body technician or a painter, it usually says something around 45,000. Um, you can make a lot more than that if you really look at the numbers. So that's something that we like to tell people and make sure that people are aware of how much you can actually make in this industry. Um, Monet, do you have something to say? Yeah, I will just add on to what you said, Alison. Uh, uh, be um, be the Canadian apprentice, uh, a Canadian skilled uh, trade professional or a foreign worker. Uh, what I find these days is is lacking in a lot of businesses is basically the recognition that a skilled professional is looking for uh, in terms of uh, appreciation for their work and not considering them as um, um, you know as a, a route to the business growth, but as a part of the business growth. So this is what I hear when I see a lot of people leaving these jobs to, you know, into the other careers. A lot of times I hear from these individuals that, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's the, it's not the, the organization they're leaving, it's the culture they're leaving. So post COVID, uh, you know, we are all resetting to a new, newer, uh, you know, newer work life. So I think the the biggest thing to to retain or attract the talent is is the culture in the organization. Mm -hmm. my, you know, is my takeaway from that. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with you there, Mona. Yeah, and can I add something, especially for the youth that we work with? A lot of them they leave the industries because they feel like they are not getting the appropriate training when they're in the shops, and a lot of the employers are just kind of asking them to do like the manual job where they have to clean the shop. They do you know things that really don't pertain to the training that uh, they would like to pursue. So I think if the employers are providing the appropriate training to this individual, specifically the youth, they'll be more engaged in terms of uh, staying with the employer for a longer period and trying to move up the ladder absolutely yeah and, and lastly from myself i mean while we particularly don't focus on say recruitment into the skilled trades we are trying to fill that shortage in the skilled trades so for us the focus is really the next generation of workers so those individuals in high school even elementary school so we're making attempts to try and reach out to those folks through career fairs which we just had a round of career fairs at the end of last year to then sort of set those people or set those young folks on that path. Right now, the trend we're seeing as high school is that people coming to those career fairs, those high school students have already decided on the skill trade that they want to get into. They just need some more information of how to do that, right? So really the focus is, is sort of shifting towards the elementary school to really start that conversation about the skill trades so that people, so that the young folks and their parents understand that these are viable careers that you know, they shouldn't just be directing their, their, their children to those you know, accountants and lawyers and doctors. And a, a little bit of what um, Monet speak to that, you know, it's that recognition of that. So right now the skilled trades don't have that recognition that we give some of those other occupations like lawyers and doctors, but hopefully one day we'll get there because let's be honest, you know, the, the places we work at, the buildings we live in, the buildings we work in, the roads we travel on, the cars we drive, that's all supported by skilled trades people. So absolutely. We've got a flood of questions in here now. So I'm not, hopefully we get to all of them here. I'll try my best to get to all of them, but we'll start with Sarah Jane. As, how do I provide a translator for one of our employees for the equivalency assessment? Who should I contact? Does anyone have any um, ideas about an organization maybe that could help with that? So for, for translators, 
So for typically for translators, for us in Ontario, they're only required at the examination stage. So through like typically the, all the communication around the assessment can be done um, uh, through written format, email, correspondence, whatever the case may be. So just typically using those uh, online translation services are, like Google Translate is usually good enough to get uh, us and the applicant to where they need to be. Where they really need is the interpreter at the exam level. And this is where we always encourage them to find their own interpreter because it could be a relative, a friend, someone who they're comfortable with, someone who may be able to spend the time with them to understand the trade that they're going to be writing the licensing for because translation is a funny thing when it comes to translating specific terminology of a trade. And this is where we always encourage if the translator can even let's say study with you to understand the words of the trade, it makes the translation a lot better when the exam time comes and actually increases your success. Some uh, for a translator who goes into the exam cold and doesn't understand the lingo of the trade, unfortunately the, the, the exam writer is going to suffer. So gotcha. Yeah. So some places you could look, I guess when you if you really need that uh, down to the assessment, like uh, Dominic said, family members if they are fluent in English. Um, I'm sure there's the power of the internet is fantastic nowadays. I'm sure there's a uh, plenty of communities uh, in different locales that you can find where somebody could help you and assist with that. So um, when it comes to the assessment stage, uh, definitely you got some time to prepare there. Um, so this attendee would like to confirm that uh, through assessment, you need annual recertification and they wanna know if the process to apply requires a sponsorship, I'm assuming from a shop. So for, for us, uh, I think one of the slides spoke to that, that you don't need sponsorship from a shop or anything like you can, it, you can be sitting once again, I use a sitting on a beach in Costa Rica and you're like, hey, you know what, let me see if I can get a 310B license in Ontario, because I've worked in the industry here in Costa Rica for 15 years, you don't need a sponsor, you don't even need to set foot in, in Canada, you can simply apply, apply through the assessment process. We have an application form. We need your photo ID. And typically, if you're international, that means a copy of your passport, like a scan, picture, whatever. And then once again, those reference letters attesting to your hours and skill sets of the trade, which we will follow up with the references to verify. So once all those things are good, then hopefully you should be approved. And then it's up to you when you want to come to write your license. There's no expiry on the approval. Once you're approved to write the exam, you can write at any time. So if it takes you six months to get to an exam center, so be it. If it's a year, so be it. It's all up to you. You want to do it while you're on vacation? Hey, plan ahead. Make sure you schedule and book. That's all we ask. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's up to you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hopefully that answers your question there, Joel. Uh, two more questions. We'll try to speed through them. Um, one person wants to know, uh, as we introduce foreign workers in our shop, what should we do specific to company culture to make our shops more welcoming? Uh, Mona, do you have any ideas there? In your uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, uh, starting with that, uh, this is this is a common issue. But then, yes, uh, the first step would be to to prepare the mindset of the existing workforce uh, to to you know embrace the cultural differences. Of course, this is a mutual thing. The foreign worker should also be be counseled uh, in terms of what to expect. Uh, what are the requirements of the you know what are the organizational specific requirements. Uh, what you can add to it is, as I said, that you can you can offer them an incentive that if you work for a certain period, will bear the legal cost of getting your family here, or maybe part of that. Uh, one is, uh, second is helping them a place to stay for some time while they are, you know, some people have their friends or relatives uh, here, or some people need help with finding a place to stay. Uh, these are the things which you can imbibe. But yes, at the same time, um, you know, we also have to, to we also have to maintain the integrity of the of the organization itself, which means the foreign worker also has to deliver. So I think communication is the key. Uh, and there are three. Um, you can you can divide into uh, divide it into three three parts. One is while hiring, um, you know, put the terms into the contract, uh, what is expected out of them, eventuality and so forth, whatever is required, and whatever they uh, they projected to be that they know the job. Uh, of course, you know, do you have to do some fine tuning when they come and start working for you? Or maybe they know more than the people that you have. And the second thing is pre-arrival, 
pre-arrival counselor counseling and then pre-arrival goes both ends to the worker and to your workforce within the organization in canada and uh, third is post arrival i think that would that would make it uh, a little smooth than expected awesome thank you <clears throat> If anyone else has anything to add, feel free. Um, I, I'm sorry, Alison. I have another question. I can see it here. Yeah, there's one more question here. Uh, yes, I will answer that. And this is a very, 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 very relevant and a very real question. So, so this person is, um, just to give some clarity to the audience, this person, uh, if you can't see the question here, has been having some problems uh, gathering documents with further, uh, further foreign workers that they have sent stuff out. So they're asking if um, this has been a trend that Monet has seen or if it's becoming an issue. Definitely. See, this is how we work on this in our organization. So basically, the moment you hire the foreign worker, you have to relay the documents list to them right away, not to wait for the LMIA to be approved. Like uh, this person, ha this organization has had LMIA approved since early January, and they are still struggling to gather the documents. Keep in mind, uh, the visa offices, and especially the visa officers, they think very differently. Uh, they are not the most business friendly people, right? Because they have their own job to do, to vet the worker, to make sure that worker has the requisite experience and, uh, you know, uh, skill set to, to be able to perform at the job. Uh, so the best thing is to work ahead of the curve. What we do is we have a separate dedicated staff which only deals with the foreign workers because the challenges are time difference. Uh, you know, it's both ways. So sometimes that person is working he can only work on collecting the documents and providing you the information when he's off work or over the weekends. So time difference is the major, you know, hindrance uh, or the major challenge. So the best thing is to, to send for an immigration professional is to send them a customized checklist along with the samples, like what kind of, how a work experience reference letter should be drafted, what is to be put in there to make sure the work permit application is successful. Uh, a lot of things are time bound. Uh, for example, police clearance certificate, every country and every part of that country has a separate processing time, processing time frame. So the best thing is the moment you have uh, selected the person and you have initiated the alumni application for them, um, the checklist and the requisite support system has to be offered to the worker. So that by the time the LMI is issued, uh, the work permit, should, the, the work, the worker should be able to file the work permit right away because the um, getting an LMI is much easier than to you know to gaze through to navigate through the maze uh, of a visa office and some visa offices are you know they work at their own pace yeah <laughs> I don't <disagree. laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, and thank you all for your questions here that we got at the end. I think we've got a lot of information here. Uh, like I said, there's information uh, for contact or uh, any links in the chat here. Uh, we'll also send out a thank you for watching that has all the information that's required. Uh, we hope you learned something here today and feel free to reach out to our fantastic speakers. They did an amazing job. We cannot thank you guys enough. Um, so thanks so much and we hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye. Bye.